How Idolatry Crept Into Christianity Part 3 Idolatry, Part 5 of 5 Description, Part 5, Some Thought-Provoking Questions A powerful challenge to Trinitarian thought, initially attributed to Theophilus Lindsay, 1723-1804 CE, and subsequently argued by Unitarian Christians worldwide. Asks how those who worship Jesus would respond, were he to return and pose the following questions. Ah, why did you address your devotions to me? Did I ever direct you to do this, or propose myself as an object of worship? B. Did I not uniformly and to the last set an example of praying to the Father, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God? John 20 verse 17. C. When my disciples requested me to teach them to pray, Luke 11 verses 1 and 2, did I ever teach them to pray to myself? Did I not teach them to pray to no one but to the Father? D. Did I ever call myself God, or tell you that I was the maker of the world and to be worshipped? E. Solomon, after building the temple said, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built, 1 Kings 8 verse 27. So how could God ever have dwelt on earth? These questions are all the more relevant, for Christians expect that when Jesus returns, he will denounce many Christians as disbelievers. As stated in Matthew 7 verses 21 and 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them. I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So if Jesus will disown some Christians who prophesied, cast out demons, and performed wonders in his name, i.e., those who say Lord, Lord, who are these disbelievers going to be? Answer, those who practice lawlessness, Jesus' words, not mine. And that is the point, isn't it? For what law did Jesus teach? During the period of his mission, the will of my Father in heaven was Old Testament law. That is what Jesus taught, and that is what Jesus lived by. So where in his teachings or example did Jesus command servitude and worship of himself? Nowhere. Just the opposite, in fact, for the Bible records him having taught, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve, Luke 4 verse 8. Furthermore, Jesus reportedly taught, why do you call me good, no one is good but one, that is, God, Matthew 9 verse 17, Mark 10, 18, and Luke 18 verse 19, and, my father is greater than I, John 14 verse 28. Perhaps for these reasons, Christians focus the first 18 centuries of their worship on the Father, and the Father alone. As Joseph Priestley tells us, praying to Jesus is a modern innovation, distant from both Jesus' teachings and time. Accordingly, the practice of praying to the Father only, was long universal in the Christian Church. The short addresses to Christ, as those in the litany, Lord have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, being comparatively of late date. In the Clementine Liturgy, the oldest that is extant, contained in the Apostolical Constitutions, which were probably composed about the 4th century, there is no trace of any such thing. Origen, in a large treatise on the subject of prayer, urges very forcibly the propriety of praying to the Father only, and not to Christ. And as he gives no hint that the public forms of prayer had anything reprehensible in them in that respect, we are naturally led to conclude that, in his time, such petitions to Christ were unknown in the public assemblies of Christians and such hold have early established customs on the minds of men, that, excepting the Moravians only, whose prayers are always addressed to Christ, the general practice of Trinitarians themselves is to pray to the Father only. Now on what principle could this early and universal practice have been founded? What is there in the doctrine of a Trinity consisting of three equal persons, to entitle the Father to that distinction, in preference to the Son or the Spirit, priestly, Joseph? 1786, The Theological and Miscellaneous Works of Joseph Priestley Edited by John Toil Rutt Hackney, George Smallfield Volume 6, page 29 What is there, indeed? Priestley records a little-known aspect of Christian history. Namely, that up to his time, late 18th century, the general practice of Trinitarians themselves is to pray to the Father only. Those who draw upon their modern Christian experience might mistakenly believe that the 21st century practice of praying to Jesus Christ dates from early Christianity. Nothing is further from the truth. For nearly 1800 years following the birth of Christianity, prayers were directed only to God. It wasn't until 1787 when the Moravian Church, a Protestant sect founded in 15th century Bohemia, in what is present-day Czechoslovakia, 
underwent a profound Pentecostal transformation and began directing prayers to Jesus Christ. So why, if the three persons of the proposed Trinity are considered co-equal, should such a preference for the Father have prevailed? And not just for a decade or two, but for the first 1800 years of Christianity? Unless, that is, a greater lesson is to be learned from the uniformity of early Christian devotions than from the inconsistencies of Trinitarian theology. Priestley was just one of many who attempted to prevent the derailing of Christian devotions from the Creator to His creation, Jesus, Mary, the Holy Spirit, and the multitude of saints. However, no historical analysis of this subject would be complete without noting that Islam has always maintained a strictly monotheistic, iconoclastic faith, as described by Gibbon. The Mohammedans have uniformly withstood the temptation of reducing the object of their faith and devotion to a level with the senses and imagination of man. I believe in one God and Muhammad, Islamreligion.com, meaning Muhammad, in medieval Latin, Polish, or French, source. Apostle of God, is the simple and invariable profession of Islam. The intellectual image of the deity has never been degraded by any visible idol, the honors of the Prophet have never transgressed the measure of human virtue. And his living precepts have restrained the gratitude of his disciples within the bounds of reason and religion. Gibbon, Edward, ESQ. Volume 5, Chapter 50, Page 533. Pauline Theology. Description, the teachings of Paul in contrast with those of Jesus, and the statements of Christian scholars on this subject. In the midst of the growing 19th and 20th century awareness of the differences between Trinitarian doctrine and the period of origins, a person might be surprised to find one group who claimed to be followers of Christ Jesus reading the following in the Holy Quran. O people of the book! Commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of God anything but the truth. Christ Jesus the Son of Mary was, no more than, a messenger of God, and His Word, which He bestowed on Mary, and a spirit proceeding from Him, so believe in God and His messengers. Do not say Trinity, desist, it will be better for you, for God is one God, glory be to Him, far exalted is He, above having a Son. To Him belong all things in the heavens and on earth. And enough is God as a disposer of affairs, Quran 4 171. Say, O Messenger, to the Christians who receive the Gospel, do not overstep the limits in your religion and do not say anything but the truth about Allah in relation to Jesus. The Messiah, Jesus, Son of Mary, is only Allah's Messenger sent with the truth. He created Him by His Word which He sent with Gabriel to Mary, which was the Word be, and He became. It was a breath from Allah which Gabriel blew with Allah's instruction. So have faith in Allah and all His messengers without making a distinction between them. Do not say, the gods are three foot. Avoid saying this false statement and it will be better for you in this world and the afterlife. Allah is the only one God free of any partner or child. He is self-sufficient. The dominion of the heavens, the earth and whatever is in between the two is His. He is sufficient as a guardian to carry out the affairs of his creation. Anisa 171 And warning. O people of the book! Exceed not in your religion the bounds, of what is proper, trespassing beyond the truth, nor follow the vain desires of people who went wrong in times gone by, who misled many, and strayed, themselves, from the even way. Quran 5 hours 77 minutes. Say, O Messenger, to the Christians, do not overstep the boundaries of the instruction you were given to follow the truth. Do not be excessive in reverence of those whom you were instructed to revere, such as prophets, regarding them to be divine as you have done with respect to Jesus, Son of Mary. You did this because of following your predecessors who were astray, who led many other people astray and who were far from the path of truth. Almina, 77 One may wonder what, from the New Testament, separates these two groups by such a vast expanse of understanding. No doubt the key difference which divides Trinitarians from Unitarians, and Christians from Muslims, is Pauline theology. For centuries the argument has been put forth that Trinitarian Christians largely follow Pauline theology more than that of Jesus. This charge is difficult to deny, for Jesus taught the law of the Old Testament, whereas Paul preached mysteries of faith. In denial of the law which the prophets had suffered and struggled to convey. In disrespect to thousands of years of revelation conveyed through a long chain of esteemed prophets, and contrary to the teachings of the Rabbi Jesus himself. Paul focused not on the life and teachings of Jesus, but upon his death. As Lehman put it, The only thing which Paul considers important is the Jew Jesus' death, which destroyed all hopes of liberation by a Messiah. He makes the victorious Christ out of the failed Jewish Messiah, the living out of the dead, the Son of God out of the Son of Man. Lehman, Johannes pp 125-6
more than a few scholars consider Paul the main corrupter of apostolic Christianity and of the teachings of Jesus. What Paul proclaimed as Christianity was sheer heresy which could not be based on the Jewish or Essene faith, or on the teaching of Rabbi Jesus. But, as Sconfield says, the Pauline heresy became the foundation of Christian orthodoxy and the legitimate church was disowned as heretical. Lehman, Johannes. Page 128. Lehman continues. Paul did something that Rabbi Jesus never did and refused to do. He extended God's promise of salvation to the Gentiles, he abolished the law of Moses, and he prevented direct access to God by introducing an intermediary. Lehman, Johannes. Page 134. Others elevate Paul to sainthood. Joel Carmichael, who commented as follows, very clearly is not one of them. We are a universe away from Jesus. If Jesus came only to fulfill the law and the prophets. If he thought that not an iota, not a dot would pass from the law, that the cardinal commandment was here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that no one was good but God, what would he have thought of Paul's handiwork? Paul's triumph meant the final obliteration of the historic Jesus, he comes to us embalmed in Christianity like a fly in amber. Carmichael, Joel. Page 270. Many authors have pointed out the disparity in the teachings of Paul and Jesus, the best of them have avoided opinionated commentary and concentrated on simply exposing the elements of difference. Dr. Reed comments. In Paul the central point is a divine act, in history but transcending history, or a complex of such acts, which impart to all mankind a ready-made salvation. Whoever believes in these divine acts the incarnation, death, and resurrection of a celestial being, receives salvation. And this, which to Paul is the sum of religion, the skeleton of the fabric of his piety, without which it would collapse, can this be a continuation or a remolding of the gospel of Jesus? Where, in all this, is that gospel to be found, which Paul is said to have understood? Of that which is to Paul all and everything, how much does Jesus know? Nothing whatever. Read, William. 1962, Paul. Translated by Edward Lummis. Lexington, Kentucky, American Theological Library Association Committee on Reprinting. Page 163. And Dr. Johannes Weiss contributes. Hence the faith in Christ as held by the primitive churches and by Paul was something new in comparison with the preaching of Jesus, it was a new type of religion. Weiss, Johannes. 1909, Paul and Jesus. Translated by Rev. H. J. Chater. London and New York, Harper and Brothers. Page 130. Which theology won the day, and why, and how, are questions left to the analyses of the above authors. Should a person come to recognize that the teachings of Paul and those of Jesus oppose one another, consideration should be given to the question. If I had to choose between the two, to whom should I give priority, Jesus or Paul? The question is so relevant that Michael Hart had the following to say in his scholastic tome, in which he ranks the 100 most influential men of history. Although Jesus was responsible for the main ethical and moral precepts of Christianity, insofar as these differed from Judaism, St. Paul was the main developer of Christian theology. Its principal proselytizer, and the author of a large portion of the New Testament. Hart, Michael H. The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history. Page 39 of the 1978 edition by Hart Publishing Co., page 9 of the 1998 edition by Citadel Press. Go figure. With regard to Paul's perspective. He does not ask what led to Jesus' death, he only sees what it means to him personally. He turns a man who summoned people to reconciliation with God into the Savior. He turns an Orthodox Jewish movement into a universal religion which ultimately clashed with Judaism. Lehman, Johannes. Page 137. The three main points where Pauline theology conflicts with that of Jesus are critical, elements so crucial that deviation from the truth threatens a person's salvation. In order of importance they rank. 1. The divinity of Jesus alleged by Pauline theology versus the oneness of God taught by Christ Jesus. 2. Justification by faith, as proposed by Paul, versus Old Testament law, as endorsed by Christ Jesus. 3. Jesus having been a universal prophet, as per Paul, versus an ethnic prophet, as per the teachings of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus was one more prophet in the long line of prophets sent to guide the astray Israelites. As Christ Jesus so clearly affirmed, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15. 24. When Jesus sent the disciples out in the path of God, he instructed them in such a manner as to leave no uncertainty in this regard, for he told them, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. 
and do not enter a city of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10. 5 6. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was never recorded as having converted a single Gentile, and in fact is recorded as having initially rebuked a Gentile for seeking his favors. Likening her to a dog, Matthew 15 verses 22 28 and Mark 7 verses 25 30. One wonders, what does that mean now, for those who have taken Jesus to be their personal Savior and presume to speak in his name? Interestingly enough, these three points constitute the greatest doctrinal differences separating Christianity not only from Judaism, but also from Islam. Running a theological finger down the backbone of revealed monotheism, Trinitarian Christianity seems to stand out of joint. To address the first of these points, Jesus is recorded as having taught the oneness of God, as in Mark 12 verse 29. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus reportedly continued with, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Finishing with emphasis upon the initial claim, this is the first commandment. Mark 12 verse 30. Not only did Jesus stress importance by sandwiching his statement between the repeated and emphatic this is the first commandment, but the importance of this teaching is equally stressed in Matthew 22 verse 37 and Luke 10 verse 27, and further complemented by the first commandment as recorded in Exodus 20. 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Jesus conveyed the above teaching from Deuteronomy 6. 4 to 5, as acknowledged in all reputable biblical commentaries, yet Pauline theology somehow arrived at concepts which have been extrapolated to support what is now known as the Trinity. One wonders how. Jesus referred to the Old Testament, what did the Pauline theologians refer to? Significantly absent from the above teaching of Jesus is the association of himself with God. There never was a better time or place, throughout the New Testament, for Jesus to have claimed partnership in divinity, were it true. But he didn't. He didn't say, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, but it's not quite that simple, so let me explain. 